Good morning. How are you all? <laughs> Beautiful day. Pretty chilly, though, for me. <laughs> um, okay, the reading today is from Revelations chapter 14, verses 1 to, uh, to 5. Okay. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn a song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Thank you. Well, beautifully read, Lizette. Uh, she's got the declarative reading, I think, going really well. But I tell you what, those words are big. <laughs> That's fairly intimidating. Uh, anyway, we'll um, hopefully that's all right and it's not, not too off-putting for you. Let's pray. God, again, thank you that you're with us. And, uh, and we just come before you. I know we've prayed and we continue to pray in, in, in faith that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, you'd strengthen us, you'd challenge us, that you would equip us with everything that we need to be your witnesses in this world today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't have much of a suntan to show for it, but it really has been wonderful to have some time away over the past four weeks. Uh, Ros and I visited South Australia. There was lots of sunshine, lots of wind, very little rain. Um, we had an amazing time. We had a very restful time. Lots of memories, good memories. Uh, a few photos to share, including just three of these. Let's see how they come up. Here we go. So up here, just one of the shots from the Flinders Ranges. And uh, that's where we, we basically spent roughly a week in each of these places. So a week there in the Flinders Ranges. Down the bottom here, um, that is, is it Mystery Cove? Is that what it's called? Memory Cove. Memory Cove in, uh, in Port Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> I'll remember it event. Yeah, thank you for that. Well done. Um, so we spent a week down there on the Air Peninsula, a place that I'd never been before. Roz did, but only as a child. And, uh, and so it was great to explore some new places. And then the final one, that was in the Barossa Valley, which was just beautiful, where we rode bikes and visited places, and uh, we just had a great time. I want to say thank you um, to everybody that just helped everything run so well while we were away, to Louis and to Dave, and also to Tim, who covered the preaching, um, for those who led the prayer times, um, and everybody that just helped things run so smoothly and to make people feel welcome. Um, I have come back, like I often do, I suppose, um, keen to not, my, not run myself quite so hard as what I were in those weeks leading up to going away. So if you've been with us and you've been enjoying helping to run um, prayer time or to just sort things out or make sure things are clean or you would like to be a part of that, and to participate in that, then I'd love to talk to you about that and how we can continue to work together to keep the church moving forward and equipped and help everybody to be equipped to, to minister to others. And I also want to say welcome to those who have joined us recently, whether you've joined online or whether you are here in person or have been here in person. I look forward to meeting you, catching up, hearing some of your story. It's great to have you with us, and I'm very grateful for that. This morning, we are going to slowly get back into our study through the book of Revelation. It's been a month 
now, so we might have forgotten where we were up to. I've also been on holidays, so I can probably declare that my mind is a little bit slow, so I'm going to need your help <laughs> as we get into that. But before we jump back into that, let me just cover what for pretty much all of us now is old news, but is still very relevant to us. Maybe you've done your own research on this, and I'd expect many of you have, and that's fantastic. Uh, there's so many great resources. But on the day that Ros and I hooked up the caravan and headed north towards um, Mildura and then across to South Australia, we heard, of course, the horrific news of the events that were taking place in Israel and in Gaza. It's hard to imagine an evil so great that would cause human beings to commit such horrific, brutal attacks. But that's the reality of what we were witnessing. And I don't know about you, I expect it's probably much the same, but it left me feeling physically sick. And as we look through and study the events that are described in Revelation, and we've been doing that just about throughout the whole year now, it does give us an insight and an understanding into why it is that God ultimately acts and judges the way he does. Just think about it. If we can't stomach just three weeks of a selection of those images, how does our holy heavenly father who created those babies, those children, those women, those men in his image, who loves them regardless of whether they know him or not, how does he stomach it? Even those whose minds are filled with hatred, those who've been come so twisted in order to act this way. God sees it all. And we know that as this age draws to a close, the evil gets worse. That's what the Bible teaches us very clearly. And so God will act. God does act. In fact, the Bible says, unless those days be shortened, unless God steps in, no flesh would be saved. And what we seem to discover and what we are discovering as we read through that his final act is swift and it is just and it is right. And that's what Revelation describes for us, as well as many other passages throughout the Bible. I wonder whether one reason that Christians struggle with the book of Revelation so much, or they want to say anything else other than what we're discovering on a fairly plain straightforward reading of the book is because they can't imagine God judging like this. But he has before and of course he will again. He must because he is holy, he is just and he is good. And the chapter that we are beginning today and we will just begin it, in fact we'll really only do the first verse by the time we come to it, but it illustrates just that. But before we come to that, with apologies for those, to those for whom this is old news, please indulge me as I make a few suggestions around what is taking place in Israel. Because it's very relevant to us. And I believe it's vital that the church in general, and our church in particular, has an appropriate response. So I hope you've been doing your research. I believe Louis has shared some things I haven't had a chance. Despite the fact that I got a telling off on the first service, I haven't been watching the, ser the service. I think Cara said that she indicated I better not be watching. Um, that, um, but I do understand that Louis shared some stuff to begin with and, um, and I'm very grateful to him for doing that. So this isn't an exhaustive response. That would take more time than what we have. But based on what is taking place, let me share a few things that for most of us, I suspect, are very well established. But let me just confirm them. Sometimes it's good for the pastor to get up and just sort of say what might have already been said, but declare that this is what we are holding to as a church. Firstly, there has, a lot, there has been, or there is a lie that is being taught in many of the churches. It's been taught for many centuries. That lie is that God has finished with Israel, that they forfeited God's promises and his blessings. The Bible deals very, clear, very clearly with this. It's untrue and it is dangerous. And it has implications for us 
And those implications are this. If God breaks his unconditional covenant with Israel, how secure are we in the unconditional covenant that he has made with us as the body of Christ? But we know that God keeps his promises. He keeps all of them. I'm going to show you very quickly how he has done that in and through Israel in just a moment. The Bible, and including what we're reading in Revelation, reminds us that the Israel of today are the Israel who are blessed and protected and beloved by our Heavenly Father. And he has promised that they will always have a purpose and a destiny in his plans. So I hope I've made that clear. It's also clear that currently as a nation, they are not living and acting and according to God's plans and purposes. Just like the Israel that we read in 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles, they are predominantly in rebellion. But that does not change God's faithfulness to them. There are consequences for rebellion. And at times, due to their unfaithfulness, God brings judgment or even lifts his hand of protection over them, enabling evil acts and deeds to take place. For example, I would invite you to pay a little attention to the event, the concert, where so many people lost their lives four weeks ago. Take a look at that concert. Look at who was being worshipped, the idolatry that was taking place, the doorway to evil that had been opened up. You see, due to the actions of human beings who hold God at a distance or even push God away, and in this case, even while gathering on the land that he has blessed them with and called them back into, was God compelled to withhold his hand of protection over those who gathered on that day? I'll let you consider that for yourself. And let it challenge you also as we consider our actions, the places we put ourselves into. Sometimes young people, let me just encourage you in this. We think we can go into this place and we can put ourselves in these things and God is there to protect us. Now God does protect us. But just be careful of the places that we put ourselves in. It also helps us to consider our attitude to prayer as we ask God to protect our loved ones, to protect his church and to pour out his blessing upon those that we know and love. That in place of prayer is so critical and so important, but so too are our actions that we don't put God to the test by going to places and doing things that we know are wrong. So it's true, Israel is still living in rebellion, even as God brought them back into the land that he had promised Abraham centuries ago. But even this is a fulfillment of his promises. I encourage you to turn with me, and I just I want to read from Ezekiel chapter 36, because this is an astonishing chapter. If you know anything about this chapter, uh, if you don't know about it, please go home, take time to read the whole lot. And while you're at it, read chapter 37 as well, because the two are linked together. In fact, they might even have something to say to us about Revelation chapter 14 today, but I'll come to that later. Ezekiel 36 is the story of history as it relates to what has, infold, what has unfolded in Israel over the past century and what happens during the Great Tribulation. I want to read a decent slab. I'm going to read 10 verses of it. I'm going to try and do it as well as Lizette read earlier. Um, like I said, I'd love to read it all. We don't have time. But as I read this, I want you to notice just how perfectly this fits history. And if you don't know enough about Israel's history over the last century, then I encourage you and I can point you to some places that will be really good teaching. I'm going to read from verse 16. Words are up here, but if you've got your Bible, it's great to follow there. God speaking to Ezekiel, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. 
Therefore I poured out my fury on them for the blood that they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. Is that not true? I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. And they, the nations, said of them, these are the people of the Lord and yet they've gone out of his land. We think, in fact, in the church, some people believe that's the end of the story. But we keep reading. But I had concern for Israel. Actually, it doesn't say that. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel. You see, it's not because they are deserving of it that God is going to do this. We don't recognize the Israel in the land at the moment because of how good they are. This is what it says, but for my holy name's sake which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. We'll come to this bit in just a moment. For, and this is what it says, I will take you from among the nations. This is God speaking. I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. You can't tell me the Israel of today is not the Israel of the past. It's not because they're good. It's not because they're worthy. It's not because they're deserving. It's because of God's holy name. Then, look at this. Then, after that, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. See, verse 24 is taking place before our eyes. It's been taking place for a while. It continues to take place. Even now, even the events of the last four weeks are drawing more and more people. And verse 25 will happen at the end of the Great Tribulation. It's... The primary purpose, it's certainly one of the primary purposes of the Great Tribulation, to bring judgment on a sinful world and to bring the house of Israel to repentance and to call upon the one whom they've pierced. Verse 23 tells us very clearly that in the end, they will worship and honour the Lord God again. So the events that we're witnessing at the moment with Hamas and Hezbollah, both who are puppets backed and driven by Iran and others. All of this is part of what was written in the Scriptures. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2, God declares this. He says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. And around the world, even today, and they have been for decades, powerful leaders of nations are dipping their oar in. They're using their political muscle to try and to work out what to do with Israel, to divide it up, to find peace. The attack that took place, even the attack that took place four weeks ago, happened as the leaders of Israel and other nations had this smug kind of look on their face. As they came out from their meetings, you see, they had made plans. They were approaching some sort of agreement. What is it that they had planned? Did that contribute? To the breach that took place too? Well, only God truly knows. Yet this is what he has to say in Joel chapter 3. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. 
This is something that will happen yet future. We'll get to that when we're studying Revelation. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. And I said to you, we'll get to, get to that a little bit. And uh, We sometimes think we're waiting to chapter 19 of, of um of revelation to be able to get to some of this stuff but we're going to see it not today but we do see it in chapter 14 as it unfolds and uh it's a it's a stunning stunning chapter i'm so looking forward to teaching we might slow up a little bit on this chapter because there's so much in it for us the events that we are witnessing will lead to some very significant prophet, prophetic events taking place now i know we'd love to take time to share those today and maybe debate them and maybe that's something for another time maybe that's something for our bible study but what is our response my friends how have you responded over the last four weeks because god has given you a mission and a purpose in that and it's that that i want to address and make really clear today firstly we must watch we've been commanded to watch we're not to say that's the other side of the world that has no you know, or I can't trust what the media says, which you can't, that's fine, but um, you are to watch, you are to look, you are to pray, you are to study the scriptures. What does God have to say about that? What do godly, you know, people that understand the word and understand what is happening, what are they saying? And then weigh their words up because not all of them are right. They're human. I'm human. Weigh my words up and consider those. So we are to watch and we must pray because that's our task. That's what our Lord has commanded his church to be doing, to watch and to pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for those who have been affected by the events of the past month. Pray for those who are still caught up in it all. Pray for believers, believers in Israel, believers in Gaza who are not allowed out and being kept there. Pray for their protection. Pray for those who are concerned for missing and captured loved ones. Pray for those who are involved in the fighting. Pray for those who are making decisions, the leaders of the nations. And pray for all people in all circumstances, whether hostile or whether peaceful, that their eyes would be open. Whether they're terrorists, whether they're caught in the crossfire, whether they're defending their home, whether they're watching from afar. I had text messages while I was away from Jewish people that were saying, Brad, are you seeing what's happening? Pray for them. Pray for them that their eyes would be opened. Because right now, God's power is on display in that place. Pray that it will be recognized. Pray that it will be acknowledged as Almighty God and pray that it will be responded to. Well, I've taken up most of our time by covering that. So let's just quickly give you a snapshot of where we're up to in Revelation and let me pose one question that I hope you can help me with. When I started out this series in Revelation, I was fully aware that it was going to be challenging, that I'd come upon some passages that would leave me scratching my head and I might look a little silly standing up here wondering what to say about things. So far, I've actually been really surprised, surprised by what the Holy Spirit has been teaching all of us as we meet together and as we study and, and just wonderfully excited and um, yeah, just so pleased at how neatly things fall into place as you begin to study them. But with this passage, chapter 14, oh, I'm not so sure. Maybe my brain's still on holidays or maybe more likely God wants us to pray and dig deeply. So let me share with you so that we can then pick it up next week. Firstly, just a quick reminder, where are we in Revelation and what is Revelation teaching us? Well, the outline of Revelation, very quickly, is given for us in Revelation 1 verse 19. John is told to describe three things. Firstly, the things which you have seen. That's what John was shown in chapter 1. That's the vision of the eternal Lord Jesus Christ. And what an amazing vision that was. Secondly, he's told, write the things which are. That's the letter to the seven churches in chapters 2 and chapter 3. They describe details and instructions for what the church of the late first century was experiencing and what the church will continue to experience right up until the church is removed from the earth. Then thirdly, he is told to write the things that will take place after this. 
That's after the church is removed from the earth. And that's what the bulk of Revelation is describing. Chapters 4 through 19 describe the great tribulation when the Lord Jesus responds to all of the evil in the earth, like what we are witnessing, and he takes back, takes back what is rightfully his. He won it 2,000 years ago on the cross. He enforces it in these chapters. That's what we are witnessing. So the battle for the earth that was won legally through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But just as we've been saying repeatedly through these series, these chapters describe what happens when Jesus, who is the only one who is qualified, takes the scroll from the Father in heaven and opens the seals and enforces this legal document. Let's call it the title deed to the earth. We've been using that phrase for want of a better word. If you've come up with a better one, I'm happy to hear that. And what follows from that is what happens from chapter 6 onwards. It's the process. It's the battle as the forces of darkness try with all of their might and even all human might. We discover it's human beings that come against God directly at the very end in order to try and hang on to the rulership that has been held on to since Genesis 3. That's the battle that we are witnessing in these chapters. And right now we are approaching the climax. We're approaching the fulfillment where as we know, because we know the end of the book, right? Jesus wins. Christ is victorious. He is glorified in this. The seals of the scroll have been all opened. That allows the document to be read and to be enforced. The trumpets have been sounded. They are a warning. They are heralding what is taking place, what is going on, what this is all about. And all of this sets the scene to bring us to the climax. And if we're looking at a timeline, and I have to tell you, timelines in Revelation are difficult and often contentious. But my suggestion to you, and I leave you know, room to change my mind a little bit later as I continue to study and God reveals more things to me, but I'd like to suggest we're approaching the end of the seven years. Because I believe the end will be mercifully short. After the sixth trumpet, there's an interlude. And that interlude may last as much as three or three and a half years before the seventh brings the bold judgments. And that's what we're about to get into in the coming chapters. During this interlude that happens between the trumpets and the, and the bowls, these, a number of things we have already covered. Firstly, in chapter 11, we saw the two witnesses, right? They've done their work. Then in chapter 12, we saw how God protects Israel in the wilderness for three and a half years. And then in chapter 13, last time before we finished, the last two weeks before we finished, we came across the satanic trinity. Metaphorically described in Revelation as the dragon and the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. Or what we know as Satan, Antichrist and false prophet. And they have all reached the pinnacle of their power and their evil. And it culminated with the enforcement of that notorious mark. 666. If you know nothing about church and know nothing about Jesus, most people still know 666 for some reason. Well, now we come to chapter 14. But before the bowls, this is before the bowls are poured out and God's judgment falls upon the earth who by now have completely rejected him. But chapter 14 poses a problem. And the more I read it and the more I read the opinions of the others, the more I discover nobody is really sure what is going on and what they are reading here. So let's have a go. This is verse 1. And this is about all we're going to cover today. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So what's the problem? Where's this taking place? Are we in heaven? Or are we on the earth? It becomes a bigger problem if you read on a little bit further, but... What, what have we got taking place here? We have the Lamb. It's obviously Jesus, right? That's been... It's obviously Jesus, right? 
That's been explained to us. We know that. Up until now, where has Jesus been? In heaven. Okay? He hasn't physically taken, uh, placed his feet on planet Earth just yet. We know at the very end he will, and he will stand upon the Mount of Olives, possibly coming from somewhere else first. We'll look into that in a couple of, in, in, over the next couple of weeks. But, but nevertheless, the Bible makes clear when he comes and he stands on the Mount of Olives, he, that, or comes to earth in Jerusalem, that's where he appears, makes his grand entry or appearance. But that's not this. He's standing, if it's on earth, he is standing on Mount Zion. But who else is there? We've got the 144,000 witnesses who have been sealed. Now, where should they be? Well, they should be on the earth. They shouldn't be in heaven until the end. And maybe not even then. Maybe that's these who were protected all the way through into the millennium. And to complicate things, it does actually describe where they're standing, doesn't it? What does it say? Where are they? Mount Zion. Why is that complicated? Because sometimes Zion describes a literal place on the earth, and sometimes Zion describes a literal place in heaven. We've got a problem. <laughs> you want to help me? Because really, really excellent godly scholars who believe everything else that we believe, that makes them good and excellent, right? <laughs> but they come to different positions on this. And they are very strong about their position on this. For example, here's one. Some suggest this must be a different 144,000. But to me, that doesn't make any sense at all. I'm sorry if it makes some sense to you. But respectfully and apologizing to those who hold this view, what I see this as, this is, a, this is one of those examples of causing a very big problem in order to rectify something else. I believe this is the same group. Doesn't mean I'm right. However, if they are the same group, it teaches us something really, really important and very, very special. So let me just talk about this for a minute. It comes in the form of a maths question. Anybody want a maths question? <laughs> Dave, you ready for this one? <laughs> I, think, I think even others can cope with this one. I don't think we'll need your expertise on this one. How many are described as standing alongside Jesus in this chapter? Okay, 144,000. As I've suggested, I believe this is pretty close to the end of the Great Tribulation. It might not be. It might be a little bit earlier, but that's, that's, that's where I see it as taking place. All right. We heard about the 144,000 all the way back in chapter 7. How many were there then? 144,000. That's right. Trick question. How many of the 144,000 were back in chapter 7? Yeah, 144,000. All right. Here's the maths question. How many are missing? None. 144,000 minus 144,000 is none. Now remember with me that prayer of Jesus when he is there with the Father on the Mount of Olives in John chapter 17, what we often call the high priestly prayer. What does he say? None of them is lost. None of them. Is lost. Now, he's not just referring to the 144,000 then. It's bigger. We'll see that in scope in a minute. Because I want you to remember that when you think about or maybe when you worry about your salvation. Jesus appears to hold himself responsible. And if that's the case, that means you're in the very best hands. When speaking about everybody who belongs to him, these are the words of Jesus. He says, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. I and my Father are one. I find that very comforting. And so I want to ask you this question. When was the last time that you knelt down and thanked Jesus? Thanked the Father for protecting you. Thanked him for keeping you safe in his hands. We should do that often, shouldn't we? 
So, back to this problem that we have. Where is all this taking place? Is it on earth? Is it in heaven? The verses that remain, as I kind of alluded to, and I won't read them out to you now, but because Lizette did such a great job, they seem to describe events very clearly as originating in heaven. The harpists, the song that might actually originate from God himself because of the phrase, like the voice of many waters, it seems to be a, voice, a, a, a phrase that describes the voice of God on a number of occasions. It's a song that only the 144,000 can learn it. That doesn't mean they're the ones that are singing it on this occasion, but that somehow in the mystery and wonder of God, they are the ones destined to learn and therefore we would say proclaim, declare to the earth the truth of this song that possibly originates from God himself. Well, there are two things that I would like to consider as we close. And I'm just putting them very gently. They are by no means, this is how it is. They just might help us to come to peace with what we're reading, if not a concrete understanding. Firstly, we've discovered often, so you know, the, the thing we're trying to deal with, Jesus should be in heaven until the very end. The 144,000 should be on earth if they're the same one. So how do we reconcile all of this? Well, we've discovered often that before events take place, we are given a description in advance, a vision of the final, um, a final event. And we're going to experience that a lot through the rest of this chapter. In fact, that which we read before, remember I said read Ezekiel chapter 36 and then read 37. It's like 36 is the word of God declaring what he's going to do and why he's going to do it. And then 37 is when, when Ezekiel stands there and God says, can these dry bones live? Okay, that's that, that's that thing. And there you see it in acting. Well, maybe it's a bit of this. Here is, we're getting a vision, a picture of what is about to take place and then it happens, Right? Maybe that helps us to reconcile a little bit because we know that God does declare what will happen so that when it happens, declares beforehand what will happen so that when it does take place, we will believe. We will know because only God can tell us the future because only God is already there, right? Do I have to tell that story again about how, um, you know, where we are stuck in our dimension and God is eternal, therefore he's outside of time. So it's not that God has lots of time. He's in all time, all the time. He is already there. That makes him right here, right now with us. It makes him in the future when all of this takes place. It makes him back in the Garden of Eden. It makes him at the cross. And that always breaks me when I think about that. He is always there so chapter 14 could be like God speaking through the prophets, declaring and speaking the word that precedes the reality, just like we read in Amos chapter 3 where it says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So that could be one explanation. Let me finish by proposing one more. And that's where the title of this message comes from. Where exactly is heaven? Because we often think of heaven as remote, far away, removed from where we are. But the more we read the Bible, the more we discover that heaven may be closer than we think. Maybe physically closer than we think. Surely, we know that God is with us. We know that he sees us always. But how close is he really? In fact, how close are the hosts of heaven really? The Bible seems to use Zion as a description of earth and also of heaven. And my question to you is, do they have to be so far apart? Is it possible for the 144,000 to be standing on the literal Mount Zion in Jerusalem and for Jesus in all his heavenly glory to be standing right there alongside them and for it to be effectively the same place? Maybe even unseen by human eyes, Jesus is there and he is standing while John's eyes have been opened. Wouldn't be the first time that's happened, has it? Remember Elisha and his servant? Open his eyes, Lord, that he might see that those who are for us are greater than those who are against us. That's 2 Kings chapter 6 if you want to go back and have a look at that story. 
Modern science has taught us that the reality we live in is greater than the four dimensions that we know and love. You know, length, width, height and time are the dimensions that we are very, very familiar with. But scientists tell us that we live in a much greater reality than that. Does that explain how heaven could be closer than we think? Does that explain how angels could be all around us? And yet only when God allows can we perceive what's really going on in those other dimensions. They're exciting and somewhat challenging questions for us. And I hope they're food for some thought and some prayer and some discussion while we have a cup of tea or coffee in a few minutes. But let me close our time together today by doing the two things that I said that we should be doing this morning. We're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to pray for those who are caught up in this event and we're going to pray for the eyes of those who do not know Jesus to see God at work in this world. And secondly, we're going to give thanks to the God who loves us, who faithfully keeps us until our salvation is fulfilled. Just like we await the fulfillment and the redemption of the earth that are described in these chapters of Revelation. It was one on the cross of Calvary. It's a done deal. And our salvation, our glorification, if you like, still awaits us. But before I do that, just let me take these moments to say that if you're with us, whether here personally or for whatever reason have joined us online and you don't know the salvation of the Lord Jesus, maybe you're worried, concerned about the events that are taking place. Many people are, particularly if they don't know the plans and purposes that God has that it's told us about so that it gives us comfort in times like this. Firstly, if you're worried and you belong to Jesus Christ, let me tell you, you have nothing to fear because it is Jesus that keeps you. And even if we are taken from this world, we would immediately be with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have nothing to be concerned about in that. But also you might be here, but you don't know Jesus. You've never committed your life. You've never invited him to be your personal Lord and Savior. You've never confessed your sin and say, I need a Savior. Let me just take a moment to speak directly to you because I want to share with you just how simple it is to accept Jesus as your Savior. He's done all the work. What you're left with is a very important decision. And let me show you and take you through how simple it is to make that decision, to receive Jesus as your Savior to be born again and to receive eternal life, to know that your salvation and your future is in Jesus' hands. He is the one that will carry you, guard you and protect you. I like to remind us that becoming a follower of Jesus, becoming a Christian is as simple as A, B, C. A says that we have to admit, admit that we have sinned, that we fall short of God's standard. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible also tells us that the wages or the penalty of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that brings us to B. B says believe. Believe that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross to pay your debt, to forgive you of your sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says Christ died not because people got the better of him or anything else, Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. And that brings me to C, and that's the decision part. That's the part that only you can do. Your mum and dad never did it for you when you were a baby. You can't do it just by walking in the doors of the church. It's a decision you need to make for yourself, and that is to call on Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior. Confess that Jesus is Lord and he is God. And by the authority of the scriptures, I declare everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Three simple steps. Admit that you have sinned. Believe that Jesus died to forgive your sin and call upon him personally as your your savior. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be good enough because we can't be good enough. No one is. God loves you and he does not want you to perish. He doesn't want you to come under his judgment that's spoken about in these scriptures. That's why he took it upon himself. That's love. He wants you to be sheltered. He wants you to be with him in heaven. And so he made a way. 
but you need to choose to receive Jesus free gift of salvation and so if you want to do that you can do it right now admit you've sinned believe Jesus died to forgive your sin and call on him as your Lord and Savior let's pray now God we thank you for your word we thank you for the comfort and the strength that it brings to us thank you for the promises that we have just declared that our salvation can be found as a gift in Jesus Christ as we come and surrender And so for those that might be hearing my voice, Lord, and as the Holy Spirit convicts their heart, helping them to know that these words are true and that they are standing at the doorway of opportunity, I pray that right now they would choose to admit and to recognize their sin that is is so obvious to them as the Holy Spirit convicts them, that they would put their faith and their trust, they would believe in the Lord Jesus and the words of the Scriptures that declared that He died to forgive us of our sins, to pay the penalty for our sin and that he rose a clean, victorious over, over sin, over death, to declare that we too, in Christ, can have victory in him and that they personally would call upon you as a Lord and Saviour. Just simply right now, in this moment, they can make that transaction from death to life. And we want to pray for them in doing so that they would grow up in their faith, they would be nourished and protected from the evil one and from his doubts, that they would have assurance and know the certainty of your presence with them and your love for them. And we pray too for all of us, even in these moments of difficulty and doubt and the, and the, the, the frustrations and the challenges that we are facing in this life, that we would stand strong against the voice of the enemy that wants to cast doubt upon our salvation, upon the fact that, God, you are with us all the time, that you love us despite what we have done, that we can just come back to you and repent of our sin and that you forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, washing us new, just as the Scriptures say. And, Lord, in this time, we want to pray too. We want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We want to pray for the people in Israel and in these areas that are described by the world as occupied territories. We want to pray for those who are trying to get out and find safety. We want to pray for those that even right now are are thinking up horrors and terrible things to do. We want to pray for those who maybe are still being held captive. We want to pray for those that have been affected have lost loved ones or still waiting to hear news. We want to pray for those who are still caught up in it. We want to pray for those who are concerned for missing or captured loved ones. Pray for those that are involved in the fighting on all sides of the equation. We want to pray for those who are making the decisions. And we want to pray, Lord, for all people. We pray that you would be opening people's eyes, whether they're terrorist, whether they're caught up in the crossfire, whether they're defending their, their home or homeland, whether they're watching from afar. Lord, that as your faithfulness is on display, as your word comes to life before our very eyes, that it won't be hidden from them, but they will see it. I think of those that I know that are reaching out and saying, Brad, look at what's happening. I pray, Lord, that they would see, that they wouldn't hold it at a distance, but, Lord, that they would receive your salvation right now and that they would know the faith and the hope, not worried about the future, knowing the certainty of today. And that brings us back to our own. And I want to conclude our time of prayer before the throne of heaven, Lord, by saying thank you. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you've promised. Thank you most of all for that gift of salvation, of doing what we couldn't do, that while we were yet sinners, Lord Jesus, you died for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And we want to thank you, Lord, that our salvation isn't in our hands, it's in yours, because we'd surely stuff it up. Thank you, Jesus that you hold us firmly and securely. And I pray for all my brothers and sisters in this place, anybody that can hear my voice who has given their life to you, that they would sense your closeness and your nearness right now, that we are loved, cherished, 
because we're family now. When you're born, you can't be unborn. When you're born again, you can't be unborn again. Lord, I pray that out of this certainty and security, out of this hope that you would fill our hearts and our lives with your Holy Spirit that would, would just radiate from our faces that joy and that love and that peace that we have in Christ Jesus, that when people see us, Lord Jesus, they'd see you. That they would have hope. They would see a way, a way out of this darkness and this hopelessness that is being experienced by so many in this world that they would find eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name and for your wonderful glory. Lord, may your name be glorified in us. Your name is holy. We've read about that today in Ezekiel. We know that there have been times when just like the nation of Israel, we too have profaned your name before others. And we come and we confess and we repent of that right now. Lord, create us new. And may our lives glorify the name of Jesus. May our lives glorify the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for your patience for being with us. And uh, if this has raised some questions, good. Um, I'm not saying I'm right about everything I've said, but I do hope it's posed some thoughts and uh, encouraged you to dig a little deeper in what we're doing and I look forward to next week as we go further into Revelation chapter 14. Let me close with a benediction. I hope you can stay around, have a cup of tea or coffee, something afterwards and uh, just look, looking forward to hearing your stories as well today. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. There you go in peace. God bless you.